Okay, welcome, Olienka. Let's get going, Alice. Okay. Uh, good day, everybody. Um, this is Alice. I'm the coordinator for Emerge Africa Network for Southern East and Eastern Africa. And I'm based in East London. And Tony and I had the opportunity to go and attend the AECT International Convention in Jacksonville, Florida between the 7th and the 11th November. And um, today we're basically just going to tell you about some of our experiences there, what our connections are with AECT, and some of the opportunities that may arise out of the interactions that we had during a very interesting week. Now, Emerge Africa's connection with the AECT is that it's been affiliated to the AECT since October uh, 2016. And because of that, we were able to send representatives. Last year, Nicola went to the AECT convention, and this year, Tony and I went. And our affiliation involves an active collaboration with AECT's Division of Culture, Learning, and Technology. That's the team that went, Tony and myself. Now, the question would arise, what is AECT? Um, AECT stands for Association for Educational Communications and Technology, and is a large, a very large professional association of educators and others, including military people, medical people, and all sorts of people involved in education and where educational change is underway. And they do a large number of activities that are directed towards improving instruction through technology um, and look specifically at the designing of instruction and take a very systematic approach to learning. Um, and because it is a large organization and there are a lot of people doing a lot of research and development work, they're also able to produce two bi-monthly journals, that is the Educational Technology Research and Development Journal and Tech Trends. Our conference theme was Leading Learning for Change. And the theme was intended to emphasize, basically, the interconnected nature of our world and the work we do, which is often subject to rapid change because, as you know, theory and practice evolve um, as we go along. And it gave scholars, practitioners, and students from around the globe lots of opportunities to meet with very interesting uh, people, to network with others, and so on. The convention was located at a very large hotel called the Hyatt Regency Hotel, which is based on the riverfront uh, in Jacksonville. What you see is a view of that riverfront. It's absolutely stunning there. Um, the hotel was just recovering from a, a hurricane and still managed to put together a large convention and run it, despite having some parts of it being out of action. The AECT consists of several divisions, as you can see, each of them targeting very different aspects of educational technology use in learning. The format of the conference involved lots of different session types, committee meetings, governance meetings, panel discussions, presidential sessions, poster sessions, workshop shop sessions, and so on and so forth. And we will present some of what we experienced for some of those session types um, in this session. Tony? Microsoft. OK, my next one. Great. This was a one-day workshop. Please stop me with the slides. I don't know who's doing that, but please stop me with the slides. Thank you. Um, a one-day workshop that was um, for what they call instructional designers, but actually we call learning designers, 
about how you go through the design and development process in ways which are um, sensible and effective and sustainable. Um, workshop led by Megan uh, Murto and Debbie Storter. Megan Murto is there in the room. Debbie Storter came in virtually. Um, and there was a lot of attention to thinking about what's involved at each stage of a de design and development process and who is involved at each stage of that design and development process. They were working on a design and development cycle of 16 weeks, with this being the kind of process that they take people through in the 16 weeks. Lots of material available and shared by the presenters of the workshop, um, and a lot of good um, effective practice to learn from there for organizations that are just getting into developing online courses. The next workshop that I went to was also a learning design kind of workshop, led by Camille Dixon-Dean from University of Melbourne, um, which had a very different focus. And the focus here was very much on the student experience of participation in an online course, and how we think about that experience, become aware of it, and try to optimize the experience. Two, rather telling quotes from Camille. One, I can guarantee that what they do isn't going to be what you intend them to do. And I think many of us who design courses have learned this and keep learning it. And secondly, that the storyboard is a path to seeing what is needed and what can go wrong. And the way we start here is what a lot of people know about already, using personas to think about a typical participant in a course. Um, and their characteristics, age, location, abilities, experience, um, what happens to them as they learn, their goals, and their pain points. And this is something which a lot of persona templates don't take account of, pain points, the things that really annoy people, the things that are deal breakers and can actually get people to drop out of a course and become demotivated, etc. And I think it's quite a useful inclusion in a persona. And then um, what came out of marketing, which is called empathy maps. And you think about um, the ways that people will experience a course in relation to their tasks, their feelings, their pain points, the influences that they bring with them, and their overall goal. Um, and I think it really is about going in depth into getting a deeper understanding of how your students are going to engage and what kinds of um, usability experience issues you really need to think about in designing the course and designing the environment, etc. Very useful stuff. We also went on to trying to map week by week um, the activities and the processes that happen in a course, including what the educators do, and what the students do, and what's happening within the learning environment, and what content is available. And I think one of the things that Camille pointed out very um, strongly is that um, if we have activities for students which require too much moving around, too much complexity, too much interaction between the content and the environment and complicated processes, that it can actually feel like a frustrating experience for students. So we need to think about mapping what our students are being asked to do and thinking about whether there are ways of simplifying learning activities and making them a little bit more seamless and in, um, sustainable and pleasant for students as well as us. Alice went to this workshop about the mentoring relationship. Will you continue, Alice? 
Yes, um, I went to that workshop because I'm really keen on this idea of taking up mentoring and trying to understand what mentoring might mean doing it at a distance and online. However, in, in, in the States, um, a lot of their focus is on mentoring uh, students to get through their PhDs and, and postgraduate qualifications, and also mentoring people to develop um, leadership within their organizations and institutions. Um, it was a very practical down-to-earth um, workshop. We, we kind of looked at the different types of, of mentoring for formal, informal development and, and novice type situations. Uh, we saw a lot of small videos of interviews of people giving sort of wisdom and ideas about um, mentoring and what it is and, and what it isn't. And we looked at why people would need uh, mentoring and what makes a good mentor. And so you can see part of the workshop involved uh, coming up with some of the characteristics um, of good mentors being a good listener, guide uh, vision, has multiple perspectives, and is reflective and is a person of, of integrity. In the same way, we did interrogate what it might mean um, to be a poor mentor and not be able to meet expectations and needs, and to be uninvolved and only reactive, and actually not having time, which are some of the things we've got to consider as we step out um, into this space. And we also looked at what makes a good mentee. In this innovative um, case-based e-learning design workshop, we basically looked at what it might mean to, to develop case-based learning um, to enhance or, and to solve real-world uh, problems. And we were introduced to a whole lot of different um, e-learning models. Um, that were based on a number of real-world uh, problems. So we weren't looking at any specific discipline. Some of the examples we looked at are in human medicine. Others were about uh, diagnosing diseases of animals. Um, there were some pharmacy, some engineering, agricultural science, and teacher education examples. Um, and we were given sort of an approach which focused on enhancing mental abilities and designing our models according to problem types. As you can see in that slide, um, some of the things that they have been looking at, there's this team that have been working on case-based um, um, e-learning for a while and have learned a lot on what is, you know, what is possible, but also learning that you can learn uh, from failure. That work for me was a really interesting aspect of it. Tony. Yeah, there were a number of really good and useful keynotes. Um, keynote by Marcy Dis Driscoll, who is a administrator at one of the universities in Florida, about leading for learning. Really asked some key questions about the role of learning or instructional designers in universities. Um, she asked, have we as a field became, become siloed? She said, I've been coming to AACT for 42 years. Why are 76% of teachers telling us they don't have the training they need to teach with technology? Wait, this is coming from the States? For people in an Africa-based network, this is quite scary to hear. Um, but maybe in some other ways, maybe potentially a little bit reassuring as well. And then, where do we begin to lead to break down the silos? Um, Clark Quinn, very helpfully, on his um, website, and you can link from that in the slides through, um, shares mind maps of all three keynotes. And he really, really picks up on how Marcy Driscoll is saying, that it's very important for people involved in the instructional design or learning design space to not be reluctant to step into leadership places 
within their universities. Um, because important decisions need to be made about teaching and learning, and it matters that these perspectives and experiences and skills are part of their decisions. Um, she already talked about the importance of um, leadership within the, in the institution, but also leadership in more public spaces, um, including engaging students in the world, including cultivating journalists, including um, becoming informed and engaged in policy processes that are beyond a university on occasion. I think that she is really interested in um, breaking down the silos between learning, des learning design, learning sciences, and the instructional design community. Um, and I think she was a good advert for the gains that are possible if people with good perspectives and experience take that step of getting involved in leadership at institutional levels. Although I'm sure many people, for example, uh, many academics would be reluctant to step into that space, she made a very good case. Um, and Alice, about Tom Reeves. Okay, Tom Reeves um, talked about a, an element of learning that we often um, do not take into consideration. The fact that learning takes effort and that it's through effort that one unlocks potential. And he kind of looked at it and in terms of 21st learning century outcomes and um, came up with this idea that the four, the four C's of learning should be five C's of learning. That is communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and conation. Conation being a way of looking at, of measuring sort of the amount of effort, the grit, the determination and perseverance, continuous effort that is required to succeed at learning and which has been discovered to be a good pre predictor of success. Which means learners must care about their learning if they're going to succeed. Um, he talked about a survey that was done where people were asked about their fears of being replaced by robots. And 37% of the people that were interviewed um, said they were afraid of being replaced by robots, of course, because they are uh, cheaper than, than humans to run in the long run. But he raised this question because we are moving into a robotic age. And so for humans to compete, we need to know whether our students have that drive to compete with robots. And therefore, this has implications for our learning and teaching. Are they actually being academically engaged in the right way? And what does this mean then for our courses and the relevance of our courses? And he was emphasizing, therefore, a need for authentic learning. And so we can have a look at that. One of the um, slides that he put up which showed all the different elements that need to be associated with um, uh, authentic learning. Authentic context, authentic tasks, expert performances, multiple roles and perspectives, uh, collaborative construction of knowledge, the ability to reflect, to articulate, and then coaching and scaffolding, and then assessing authentically. And then, I guess it was in a way a, a response to the first keynote speaker who talked about the fact that everything we tend to do is siloed. Um, Derek Cabrera came up with a keynote where he looked at systems thinking. And he put it in a very simple way. Um, he pointed out that there are many types of thinking associated with the mastery of content, and that everything we do is, is part of a system. And he, he started out as a mountain guide. And it's through his experiences as a mountain guide, which is 
quite a dangerous job that he came to this kind of system type of thinking. And he said that wrong thinking is dangerous because we live in a world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And yet, the reality is that our thinking tends to be linear, anthropocentric, mechanistic, and ordered. And those things don't fit together because our world in reality is non-linear, it's agnostic, it's organic, and it's chaotic. So he was emphasizing that our mental models are important and that they evolve and are an approximation of the real world situation. So he looked at the fact that uh, this slide shows wicked problems result from the mismatch between how real world systems work and how we think they work and therefore uh, the danger in that. Um, our mental model would normally involve information that we have and our thinking. And in education, we often replace knowledge, which is not the same as information, with info, making education over-engineered and structured, and simply because we have expectations and a need for a very clean, ordered process. We don't like learning to be messy. So in doing this, we're creating consumers of information instead of builders of knowledge. And he gave an analogy that a mind is like a messy construction site where building of knowledge occurs from raw materials. And he was saying that our curriculum, as we think about our curriculum, our curriculum should consist of info plus building. In other words, our curriculum must be under construction uh, continually in order that it may become a builder of knowledge, uh, bringing about by Brent and robust development. And he just reminded us that thinking is not as simple as we think it is. It involves mixing and matching of various rules to form complex networks made out of distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. And he finished off with the last comment which said, life did not overtake the globe by combat, but by networking. Um, basically implying that um, life systematically and organically took over the globe through the different sets of networks and systems that were formed. Tony. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, um, I picked up on one of the presidential panels that I went to, and you notice that um, the events through the ACT conference were either associated with one or sometimes two divisions in collaboration, or they were keynotes or presidential panels um, or workshops. The divisions had a very major role in determining what went into the conference, um, and I think it's an interesting model of delegation within an organization. This presidential panel was about leading innovation, how to use social media, mobile learning, MOOCs, and open educational resources to transform learning, and had some um, really interesting and challenging presenters um, on the panel, including um, Kurt Bonk and what's his name, first name Wiley, um, and Clark Quinn and Vanessa Denon. Um, Kurt Bonk was talking about three major changes in learning including learner engagement, pervasive access, and customization. Um, he pointed out that in terms of the usage levels, despite what um, I think Eudemi are saying, MOOCs are not dead, and that there are um, at least 20 different ways of using MOOCs in different contexts for different purposes. And he outlined all of those. David Wiley was speaking about the use of open resources and open educational practices in relation to inter interaction with content, computing, communication, and capture of information by students as part of the learning process. And he asked, how can we um, augment formal learning? How can we support performance? How can we provide spaces and processes for social learning? And how can we leverage of the context 
that the students are experiencing. David Wiley, absolutely right. And then um, Vanessa Denon, um, who is an expert who we hadn't heard of before, came up with some really useful processes and principles for dealing with social media. And she was saying, forget Facebook. Um, it's not our primary focus as to where we should be doing social. Don't try to replicate the LMS. Get into the mindset. Know the mindset, otherwise you can't do the practices. Start with the activity, not the tools. Good design principle. Identify tacit learning activities. Consider the discomfort that activities and processes may entail for students. Bring students into design and planning. Discuss issues like intellectual property and authorship. And track the activity and impact of students and yourself as an educator. Um, and I think if anyone using social media as educators um, was able to systematically cover all of these principles, it would be a big improvement in the way we use social media. Clark Quinn pointed out that mobile learning, e-learning, and m-learning are not the same thing, that we can use software features to augment intelligence, that we need to use the principle of least, least assistance. What's the least we can assist people um, in ways that support their learning um, so that it means that they get to do as much as possible and take as much agency themselves. We need to leverage context into learning moments. We need to plan for platform use. And, of course, any truly powerful technology is indistinguishable from magic. A format that I hadn't seen before at a conference was the idea of the breakfast with champions. Set up early in the morning for breakfast at one of the largest meeting rooms in the hotel with 31 experts at 31 tables. Um, you pick up your food, you go to a table, you join a discussion. Halfway through, you step across to another table and join another discussion. So you have a chance to have a small table discussion with experts. Um, I went to the editor of one of the journals and to Marcy Driscoll. Um, and there was a lot of choice, depending on what people cared about, depending on, I think, for some of the PhD students, the topics of their PhD research, and the kind of career paths they were seeing them themselves pursuing. No, it's not like World Cafe, Gabriel, because the conversations at all the tables were completely different and about different topics. World Cafe, you try to join up the conversations. Alice, about our events. Okay. Um, we did not only go to consume, we actually went to present, to make presentations at the convention. and. We were involved in um, basically uh, three events, uh, mostly with uh, the, the CLT division of AECT. Um, I participated in recontextualizing OER for diverse learner audiences. It, it was a panel discussion, and we had a number of different people from um, different um, higher education contexts who sat down together to talk about um, OER and how one, uh, some of the things that we need to consider uh, when recontextualizing them, had some um, pretty robust uh, uh, conversations and inputs from um, different people. We also had then um, another uh, panel discussion with the CLT where we sat down um, and discussed and presented, each of us presented our um, organizations, Emerge presented itself, AECT's CLT division and their international division presented themselves. And we discussed about um, some of the things we were doing and possible areas around which we might collaborate. And then, Tony, do you want to talk about the powers of networks? OK. We had a wonderful opportunity because 
In terms of the affiliate agreement, there is a slot set aside for us, for Emerge Africa, at the convention every year. So we had a chance to sit together with colleagues from different places, including colleagues from the CLT, Cultural Learning and Technology Division, um, and others who are interested, and talk about where we were and what we are doing as Emerge Africa, um, including our progress and some of the challenges that we were experiencing. We got an audience. We had voice. We didn't get much feedback, but there was a sense of being heard. And then we met um, another colleague from Ethiopia who's studying post-grad in um, the US who was at the same event and started talking a little bit about his research projects in Ethiopia and the, and the particular characteristics of the environment which may enable and sometimes constrain the growth of the use of ed tech in Ethiopian education. Olufemi, um, the recording will be available to you. Thanks for joining us. OK, um, and uh, there's a common thread that runs through all of these, and that is culture, learning, and technology, that division. Because the person who brought us into AECT, Tutelani Asino, who's based at Oklahoma State University currently, um, is now the president of the Cultural Learning and Technology Division, and shared the session that we had about Emerge as well. Ah, oh, and this is a pick from the session that was about global collaboration. Um, and you have in the background, you have Alice and you have Tutuleni, and then you have two people in the back, the front, surnames I haven't got at the tip of my tongue, um, Nicole from Ecuador and um, Justine, who is a uh, postgrad student and currently president of the international division. I'm not sure if she's from Taiwan or China. Ah, oh, on to the highlights. There are so many highlights and so much going on, um, but. For me, three of the highlights beyond what's already been said include some opportunity to refresh perspectives and knowledge. A lot of what was said and shared was not new, but there were different spins, different angles, different variations, different cases, um, even in what sounded familiar. Wonderful opportunities to network with AECT colleagues, and there are so many good and interesting people there for current and future collaborations, and also the warmth and dynamism of the people within the organization and the culture of the organization as a whole. Um, I was really impressed by that. The dynamism also for me relates to the fact that you've got lots of people who are veterans of that space, who've been going to their conferences for decades, maybe sometimes over 40 years, and then you have um, postgrad students in their first conference, for example, um, and a lot of bright, young, buzzy PhD students and some slightly older, more experienced um, PhD students who got into this after several years in the workplace. Yeah, and it wasn't all um, intense activity focused on work. There was, for example, a games evening, which was quite fun. And my estimate was at least maybe 50 to 60 people uh, decided to join the games evening with a whole range of different kinds of board and card games, which you could just join and, and have some fun. Um, and the one evening there was a jam session where a bunch of guitarists and the bass player and a harmonica player got together and jammed, mostly kind of um, folksy, bluesy music. And it was really lovely, a different kind of experience of a conference, indeed. Alice. Um, this was the first time that I, I kind of went to um, a conference and I really enjoyed the keynote addresses 
uh, they were interesting, they were relevant, they were thought-provoking and, and, and very inspirational. I'm, I'm not a fan of keynote addresses, but I enjoyed these ones. Um, I also had great fun meeting people face-to-face uh, -face that I had been chatting to through either email or online and establishing connections and identifying potential areas uh, of collaboration. It was a really exciting time and we also went with stuff that they were very interested in and were keen to learn about. So we did not go there as just consumers. We also went with our stories and, and they were heard and they were received with open arms. And to me, just seeing how the whole thing unfolded and, and what happened um, made me think about what it's possible for Emerge to grow into and to become as an African edtech network. Um, they set a standard that we could aspire to, to set in our own African context. And then, uh, we, we're going to sound a little bit like we're gushing, but, but it, was, it, was a, it was a good convention. Um, things that um, kind of stood out about AECT as a whole over the entire week was there was constant recognition of achievement at all different levels in all the divisions with students, with interns, and so on and so forth. And people will be constantly being given recognition and received awards. Um, there was a strong um, sort of level of inclusiveness and, and support at many levels. There was a desire to learn from newcomers such as ourselves. There was generosity. They, 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 they were um, a very generous in many ways, including paying for some of our costs um, at the conference. Um, you got a sense that it was, there were strong friendships, strong relationships, and that the AECT was a, a family. There was a strong identity. People identified strongly with it. Um, there's a sense of welcome and encouragement. And one thing that they're doing well is the purposeful development of future leaders for the organizations, the divisions, there are several divisions, each of them strong in its own way. And interestingly enough, they have very strong connections in East Asia at this time, and I think I'm moving sort of into the African space now through us and through eLearning Africa. The other thing that they have in their system is inherently democratic processes. So people that are going to become presidents and so on and so forth. There's a whole democratic process that everybody is aware of and that people go through to move into the particular portfolios and posts and titles that they are. And then clearly, as an organization, it's a very research and innovative, an innovation-driven organization. And I think they're their journals and all their publications and things that go out bear strong testimony to this. And these are some of the things that I feel we could aspire to develop in our own organization moving forward. Yeah, I'm very aware that um, we're in this phase where we are um, totally effusive about ACT, mm. but that's because we're seeing good things from them. Um, and I suspect that if we got more involved and, for example, got somebody at some future stage onto the board of AECT, we might start to see where things get a little bit messy. But all organizations have places where things get a little bit messy. And my sense is that AECT is an organization that is potentially worth engaging with at that level um, because um, there is just so much good stuff going on. Um, and really, I was impressed by the interactions with people in leadership, right up to the level of the president, 
And I think it says something about it that this organization has a softly spoken um, and really sharp Canadian as president currently. Yeah, and a pic here of Alice together with Lenny and Camille Dixon-Dean. Um, and Tutelani and Camille, I think, um, both um, move between the CLT, Cultural Learning and Technology and International Divisions, and Tutelani has been absolutely crucial to our involvement in AECT um, over the years. And what have you got out of this as Emerge Africa? It looks, seems to me like our networks get bigger with every conference, although mostly with this conference it was about deepening the collaboration with people in CLT and making our presence within the AECT um, network um, more consistent. It's likely that we've identified some future presenters for events and probably also for an online conference. Um, we've had access to a broad base of ed tech expertise and knowledge that goes beyond what we've got available and actually is in areas that um, possibly are current there but not yet um, visible in the African scene. I really want to extend thanks to AACT for their support for our participation through the affiliate agreement. And that includes, for example, the affiliate agreement says one person from the organization will have their registration fee and accommodation covered by AECT. This year, they generously covered both Alice and myself for both of those, which would have been major costs. Um, and that is acknowledged with thanks. Also, thanks to Tutelinius. Um, Asino for his partnership, which is just ongoing, and we keep um, engaging and planning and strategizing together. And um, there's a person whose name isn't here, who's in the room, Nicola Pallet, for being at the conference last year. We'll get there, Nicola. Being at the conference last year, and for laying the groundwork for the relationships we are working with this time. Um, Peter, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. And then, of course, AECT member benefits. Um, for a radically discounted rate of $30 a year, with a special discount organized in terms of the affiliation agreement, Emerge Africa people can join AECT and get access to their networks, get access to publications and resources, including a whole range of proprietary books um, which and journals which would not otherwise be available um, to people whose libraries don't subscribe to them, access to online community tools, opportunities for students. Um, if you're interested, ask us about the discount code, um, and you'll have access to all of that. And also, if you want to come to the conference as an Emerge Africa member, if you joined as an affiliate, then um, as an affiliate member with a discounted membership fee, you also get a discount from the conference. So lots of things um, which would be in your favor if you're looking at those bigger global connections. And then what was happening at the time? Yeah, um, the special investigator was interviewing a top White House aide. Um, it looks like in terms of um, the investigation of the relationships between the Trump campaign and Russia, that the investigators are closing in in some ways. It was pretty momentous in those ways. Um, and then it was also um, Veterans Week for military veterans um, when we were there, the culmination of it being the weekend um, when the conference ended. Lots of events, flybys and parades, lots of stuff happening. And public um, announcement of it through um, even on the planes on the way back from the conference. 
and then being in Jacksonville. It's a very interesting city, geographically huge, really terrible for people who don't have cars, um, but really beautiful in some ways with a lot of um, war murals and a lot of outside art. And here we are um, with um, a view of from the Jacksonville landing across the river during the day and a view from Jacksonville, Jacksonville landing um, across the river at night as well. And I want to thank you all for being here and joining us. Um, there may be time for a couple of messages or questions at this point. But I want to ask you, what are your takeaways from this report back? Your takeaways, your reflections, what you'll carry with you. And Alice, if there's anything you want to say in terms of closing reflections, please go ahead. So I think we said a lot. Um, it was just an eye-opener to attend that sort of conference and to see how the Americans do it. It was really very interesting. Love to hear thoughts from others in the room. Since there are still a few people here, not just um, Facebook Live and Periscope Live. <laughs> Any of your takeaways or thoughts as we um, draw to the end of this event? Yeah, Jakob, there are many exciting possibilities, and we're just scratching the surface at the moment. And the world is full of wicked problems. Me too what, Gabriel? Yes, Ruth, activity drives learning. It's about the design of the learning activity before we get fixated on tools. A lot of people in the space haven't really got that yet. Dr. Amani. Mohammed, or Yenka, or Stephen, anything you want to say at this stage as we're getting ready to go? Yes, collaboration will continue and deepen. Thanks, Stephen. Very glad you joined us.